Luke 5. So if you remember last Wednesday we were talking out of Luke chapter 5 and we learned some things about faith that we we need to raise the white flag of surrender in our lives and realize that maybe we're not as smart as we think we are. Maybe we're not as strong as we think we are. Remember Peter and the Lord told him to launch out into the deep and he'd spend a whole night failing at the thing he was best at. But when he trusted in the Lord, he was successful. And uh, we're going to pick up in that same chapter of Luke. Uh, a lot of examples of faith in this chapter. We're going to be reading in Luke 5, verse 12. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold a man full of leprosy who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. What confidence. What confidence he had. What was his confidence in? It's in the Lord. Verse 13. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word and a Wednesday night where we can study the Bible together with our friends. Oh God, come in power on each listener and speak and teach through me so that we may learn and grow together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you know, when you get to that place where um, the doctors have given up and all we can do now is pray and trust God and, and they say, really, has it come to that? No, that's, that's the first thing we need to do. We, first thing, first sign of trouble, we need to go to God and trust God and pray to God. Trust in God. Believe in God. Put your hope in God. So in Luke 5, we have we have a leper. I don't know uh, how much you know about leprosy, so I'd like to tell you a little bit uh, that I've learned about leprosy. It was past the point of all hope. To be healed of his leprosy, he needed faith past the point of impossibility. He needed to fully trust the reliability of his God. Kind of like when we talked about David. He had faith in God. He needed faith in God. By faith, he defeated Goliath. By faith, Elijah had faith in God. And God sent the fire from heaven. Gideon had faith in God. Samson had to have faith in God. Daniel 6. Prayer became illegal. Daniel had to have faith in God to pray even when it was illegal. And then he had to be have faith to be delivered from the mouths of the lions. Faith sees its full potential when it's the only thing you have left and you put all of your faith and your hope and your trust in the faith in God and what He can do. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Oh, the faith of Paul. God, our God, is able to deliver us, said the Hebrew children before they were cast into a furnace of fire, and God was able to deliver them. We need to have faith like a Daniel. We need to have faith like 
Gideon, like David, like Elijah, like Paul. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the Lord our God. Be confident. And I want to talk to you about being confident in faith. He is able. He is able. Do you know that song? Can you sing it with me? He is able. He is able. I know. He is able. I know. My God is able to carry me through. He is able. He is able. I know. He is able. I know. My God is able to carry me through. Okay. <laughs> what about this song? God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Did you ever hear that song before? No. Oh, yeah. Come help. Come help. God. It's pretty easy. There's not a lot of words. challenge you to have faith in God. Remember Peter had faith in God. Now we find a leper. When you have leprosy, it's a picture of a type of sin. Leprosy pictures sin uh, that comes from being in the world. Um, leprosy was an incurable disease. It There was it was kind of like um, you had to quarantine. They made them wear a mask or a covering over their mouth. If you couldn't, uh, if somebody was coming down the sidewalk and you were a leper, you had to cross to the other side of the street and cry out, unclean, unclean. The, uh, you weren't allowed to live at home when they found out you had leprosy. They quarantined you. You could only live... Um, outside the city with the other lepers. So it destroyed the flesh of your body. It divided you from your family. And it disparred you from fellowship with God. You weren't allowed to worship in the temple or come into the camp the, the, when they were having a special feast day or a, a special sacrifice at the temple. It was, it was hopeless. No one was ever allowed to touch you. Do you know anyone who's got that? They're, they're so broken, there's no hope that they'll ever be able to be put back together. Or so it seemed. So he came to Jesus. And he had faith. And he said, Jesus, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And I love, I love Jesus. He put forth his hand and touched him. Oh, wait, no one's allowed to touch a leper. But the only one who could was the high priest when he was applying the, the blood. And Jesus was our high priest. We're going to find out later if, if I get that far in our study tonight or maybe the next study we have on faith. So 
I want you to look at the leper's condition. He was full of something. He was full of disease. He was full of failure. There was, I'm sure he tried everything. When the first time you see just a little spot of leprosy on your skin, you, you try to get it healed because if it starts spreading and it's leprosy, then it's going to divide you from your family. Oh, but when he was cleansed, look at his cleansing. Oh, happy day when Jesus touched me. He touched me. He touched me. And oh, the joy that fills my soul. He was healed immediately. The confidence he had. Calling Jesus Lord. He knew Jesus could heal him. His confession. Saying, if thou wilt. Thou can make me whole. So, uh, we'll be coming back to Luke 5 each week to look at another example of faith. But the, the book in the Bible that talks a lot about faith, probably the book with the most about faith, is the book of Hebrews. Now, Hebrews, Hebrews was written to Jewish people and the Jewish people would have understood these uh, things that were being taught. It was probably written by the Apostle Paul, but there's no um, author claim on it. Because uh, that's why I believe it was written by the Apostle Paul. Of course, it's divinely inspired, but Paul had a unique uh, burden for Jewish people to get saved. And Jewish people had a really hard time believing and, but they, they there's one thing they agreed together on that they didn't like the Apostle Paul <laughs> so um, one of the things that the Lord Jesus did when um, he gave the great commission is he gave some sign gifts um, to the Apostles where they could perform miracles that the miracles were designed to help the Jews be able to believe the gospel. <clears throat> so the, the topic of the discussion in the book of Hebrews that Jews would, would understand were the stories about Abraham and Melchizedek and about the high priest and about Moses and the tabernacle. And so we need to be humble and realize when we need help. And this is what the Jews had a, had a problem with. So that's probably why I talk so much about faith in the book of Hebrews. We should try to fight our battles alone. The more we learn, uh, the more we realize that we really don't know very much at all. So I want you to be encouraged as we look at these great heroes of the faith. Because as I studied this out, these were people like Abraham and Noah and Enoch and uh, Gideon and Samson. And uh, it, it, there's a huge list that we probably won't get to tonight, but I've been, I've been dying to teach you about these people. But you know what? The, the Bible tells of their humanity and even the mistakes they made. And when we see the great examples of these people who God says they had great faith, you know, there's people just like us. They struggled with fear, doubt, depression. They, sometimes they wandered around seemingly with almost no idea of where they were supposed to go or what they were supposed to do. Uh, in the Old Testament, the closest word we have to the word faith is the word trust. So I'd like to quote in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we need God to help us know what to do. So we need to trust or put our faith in God. Especially when we don't know what to do. So, turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, I'm going to touch 
on some some verses. Take your time and get over to Hebrews chapter nine. We're going to talk about something called the tabernacle. I've got a lot. I don't have a lot of funny illustrations tonight. At least I'm not planning to give any. But you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but um, this. This is kind of heavy Bible study night. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with the Christmas tree over here, and now we're going to have a lot of fun with the Word of God. Because um, I was saved for several years till I till I learned about the tabernacle, and when I learned about it, I was like, "Wow, wow, this is so amazing!" And I'm excited about this truth, and I hope that uh, this truth in Hebrews chapter 9 about the tabernacle will be exciting to you also. So, nine, Hebrews 9, 2 For there was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. So, there was this tent. I'm going to call it a tent. Moses commanded God to build a, a tabernacle. And it was a place for God's presence to reside. The, the outside of the temple, there was, there was a courtyard. There was an altar for sacrificing animals. And then uh, before the priest would go into the tabernacle building. There was a, a big pot of water and he would wash. And a lot of these things, I'm going to come back to them and explain them again. So don't feel like I didn't explain it enough because uh, this was a, a, a cleansing ceremony with water where the, the priest would wash before he would go into the building. And then when he went in, uh, there would be a candlestick. You've probably seen uh, like a Jewish symbol at around Christmas time of the Jewish candlestick. Sometimes they call it a menorah. There was one of those in there. And then there was a table where there was fresh bread laid on that table. It was called the showbread. And then uh, we discussed this uh, another time when we were talking about prayer. There was, a, there was an altar with incense burning on it. Because uh, though the priest had gotten clean from the world, he, God didn't even want him smelling like the world. <laughs> so a lot of these are kind of symbolic. Then there was a six inch thick curtain. And only one man, once a year, the high priest was allowed to go in to that room. And that was called the holiest of all the holy of holies and there was um, the ark of the covenant which was a table um, maybe a little smaller than the, uh, the baptistry and it had um, angels on each side of it with their wings that were spread across the altar and inside the box was the ten commandments that uh, God gave to Moses and Aaron's rod and Moses' rod and a pot of manna. So all that, um, it, there were actually was a place like that on earth. And then Solomon um, built uh, like a stone building that they called the temple. And it was it was set up exactly the same way, and they they took it out of the tent and put it into the the temple building. But when Moses built it, God said, "This is a picture of an actual temple that there is in heaven." So there was an actual temple on earth. There's an actual temple in heaven, and the one in heaven. Jesus took His blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat to cover all of our sins. But there's also a symbolic truth in um, 
the Bible, it talks about when Jesus went to the cross and he was crucified, that veil, that six inch curtain that would have been a, impossible for a man to rip was rent in twain and allowing access, direct access to the Heavenly Father. We don't have to pray outside the temple and have a priest go in with our prayer to the altar of incense and pray for us, we can go directly to God and pray to Him because our High Priest is Jesus Christ. So, the courtyard, the labor, there was the pot of water where the priest had to wash. That's the symbol, symbolizes a clean life, the Christian having a clean life. This is all, this is all related to us uh, getting faith. Do you want faith in your life? Then clean up your life. Then you walked into the first room. There was a candlestick. And that symbolizes letting our light shine, our soul winning. Do you want to have faith? Strong faith? Then you need to be a soul winner. The, the showbread on the table, it symbolized the Word of God. So if you want to have faith, you need to be in the Word of God. The incense altar symbolized prayer. So if you want to have faith, you've got to pray. And God doesn't want you to even smell like the world. So our bodies. You know, the Bible says about our bodies being the temple of God. And it says, Whosoever does defileth the temple, him will God destroy. So a Jewish person would have, wouldn't have ever thought of doing graffiti on the side of the temple building because he, be, he would fear being struck dead. They, they would actually pick up stones and throw them at him and kill them immediately because um, you know, it was sacrilegious. You know, they think it's a holy building. Now, that we know today the church isn't a building and this is, this is a building. The holy temple is each person in this is each person in this building. The church is the people in this building. This building um, is, is holy in a way. It's set apart for, to perform church services in here. But it is just a building. But your body is holy, and you need to be careful not to defile your temple, especially if you're trying to uh, have the blessing of God and trying to get faith from God. So let's look in chapter 10 of Hebrews and verse 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Some of the, the my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, are these these next three chapters of Hebrews. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's talking about prayer. I mean, do you want faith or not? Well, you're going to have to pray. You're going to have to pray and ask God for it. Verse 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Assurance of faith. So I'd like to talk about our assurance of faith. We can be sure that we have faith, but a lot of people that say they have faith, especially in the world, their faith is not pure. It's a, it's a worldly type of faith. You know, when, when somebody in the world or in a cult says, talks about their faith, their faith is not faith. Their faith is works. If you look in, in the book of Romans, it talks about either it's by faith or it's by works. And somebody who's trusting works for their salvation, they don't have no idea what, they have absolutely no idea what faith really is. So uh, it makes me a little angry when I think about people talking about their faith when it's actually works. So, but we have an assurance of faith and an assurance of salvation. What about our profession of faith? So, the assurance of faith, 
represents the labor. <laughs> it's pure. The Bible says it's pure in verse 22. In verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. What's the profession of our faith? That's the candlestick. That's telling people. It's our job to tell people. Profession means you're telling people. Verse 38 of chapter 10. Now the just shall live by faith. Living by faith. What does it look like? Prayer. That's, that's our incense of altar. Look at verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. That's what we're trying to talk about. Confidence. Confidence. What kind of confidence? That if we have faith in something, we're going to receive it. The answer to what we need or the rewards. Verses 23 and 24 say, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise. What did he promise? He promised those precious promises that we were talking about the other night. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. So what is the confidence and the, and the rewards? I compare it to church attendance in the Christian life. Symbolic of, so we have these symbols, the assurance of our faith symbolizes not being worldly, being clean from the world. The profession of faith is, symbolizes the candlestick and our soul winning. The life of faith, what it looks like, it's a life of prayer. The confidence of our faith is represented by our church attendance. The Jews were required to come to the temple building three times a year during a special sacrifice or a feast. You know what would help us to have more faith? We need to show up. Every time there's something at the church, we need to show up. That'll help us have faith. We need to shut up. <laughs> Don't ever tell anyone to shut up. But when we're, what I'm talking about shutting up is we need to not tell God our ideas, but we need to listen. We need to be listening. You know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> do you get the idea? He wants us to listen. So show up and shut up. <laughs> That's a good recipe for getting faith. <laughs> uh, no, it's kind of, I like saying shut up, but not to my wife because I, I would... I would be seeing Jesus tonight. <laughs> uh, confidence. Do you have it or did you cast it away? Okay, verse 20. i got to look at the clock here. Okay, so um, this is taking a little longer than I thought it was going to take. And I know maybe to you this is not as exciting as it is to me. But if a Jewish person was learning about this, for the first time, they would be on the edge of their seat because they knew all about this temple. And wow, if they were finding out that actually their body was the temple and, and that these things do have symbolic meanings and we can get faith if we'll be a holy temple. Consecration, verse 20. <laughs> Chapter 10, verse 20. Um, you know that I don't preach very long, so... But I'm trying to help you get the faith. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us. So our consecration, we're holy just like that temple. We have someone who's praying for us. The Bible, I love one of my favorite verses of the Bible is in Romans 8 where it talks about uh, he maketh in intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. But we have the Holy Spirit praying for us. If you, K-N-O-W, if you know Jesus, you can know peace. Verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, 
If you know Jesus, our high priest, then you know peace. But if you N-O, if you have no Jesus, you have N-O, peace, no peace. Because we have an intercessor, we have a high priest praying for us. Faith, we can have faith because we know that we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm just going to um, give you an introduction for next time we meet. Next time we're going to be talking about how to have strong faith. So we know uh, a little recipe here that can help us to have faith if we'll look at our bodies and our life as being a holy temple and we'll do those things we'll think of those pieces of furniture in the temple the labor and we'll, we'll have a clean life and we'll think of the candlestick and, and we'll want to go soul winning why? because we know we need faith someday, maybe you don't think you need faith right now but there's going to be someday you're going to wish you had faith to get some answers to prayer strong faith and we're going to talk about having how to have strong faith next time but a recipe to get faith is to be soul winning to be in the word of god the table of showbread to have a prayer life and the the holy of holies only the high priest can go in there and that's a symbol of our holy spirit intercessor jesus christ praying for us so next time we're going to be looking at some ideas about having strong faith and some examples in the Bible. Abraham, and, and we're going to really uh, help you to apply this to your life. And so, just as a, how can I apply this to my life? Start with the faith you have. And don't compare your faith to somebody else. And when we talk about these stories of faith next time... Let those stories of faith motivate you. The, the stories of, of Daniel and the Hebrew children. The stories of Gideon and David. The stories of Elijah and Samson. And uh, of course, to get faith, you've got to be justified by faith. So uh, we, we just touched real briefly on chapters 9 and 10 in Hebrews. And next time, we'll be talking about Face heroes in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Let's pray.